so I'm genuinely delighted to uh to have you back on and you know with the things we were just discussing before now um it felt like it just gave some little openings to what we could talk about in this episode and you know the last one I really thoroughly enjoyed and actually really enjoyed listening back to so thank you for being here once again oh Sabri it's an utter delight to be here I was thrilled when you asked me back I like you really enjoyed our last conversation and listened to it a couple of times actually I thought we had we plumbed some depths that I was delighted to go to oh beautiful beautiful so before we just um hit record we were just talking about bowing to the mystery and um I thought I want to I want to capture this because I can feel the the wisdom that's there and laced with humility and as we were talking pre-record I was just talking about some of the relationship things that I'd been navigating and um you asked me what were some of the things I had to surrender to and both Colette and I, we said it feels like there needs to be a list of tenants that we always look to as reminders. And one of the things was humility. And we just kept coming back to how important it is, like how important humility is within a relationship, but within life itself. And then you were just talking about bowing to the mysteries. And I felt like, ah, it seemed like those, like they thread together. So it'd be nice to, um, to kind of, you know, maybe weave that into the conversation and bow into the mystery and you know what what that means to you. Mm, beautiful. Well, I'd be delighted to explore that. I suppose that just off the top, it 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 has to do at least in part with like the bowing to the mystery and humility are partnered. Um, I have spent a life uh, not particularly uh, marked by humility. Um, I'm sure as a defense against some perceived childhood disadvantages of being a little too small and too young and, and, uh, clawing my way through, um, the world I was uh, faced with too small and too young, uh, with, uh, with, uh, the weapon of arrogance. And, uh, at this point in my life, it's important for me to remember that I actually don't know what I thought I knew. Um, And uh, that it's fine that I don't know. And that's what the word mystery is for, is to hold all of that which I don't know, which is infinite, and then bow before that infinite, unknowing, unknowable in humility. It's a daily lesson around here in my life. Yeah. It, it feels to me that holding the belief that we either know or that we have to know really is quite a lot of pressure for one to live with. And I think there's something to be said for abandoning the notion that I know, um, and and surrender you know, we, we mentioned surrender before almost like surrendering to well, I, I thought I knew you know, rather than I know I thought I knew but just this openness to the possi- all the possibilities outside of you know what I've yet experienced um, it seems like actually letting go of that I know could probably be quite liberating very very. I led a one day retreat yesterday and it's a, basically the design of this retreat is something I've been doing for probably 15 years and I've been familiar with for nearly 30 years. And the tendency with that kind of familiarity with this retreat format is to think, oh, I know I'm going to do this and then they'll do that and then I'll do this and then the retreatants will do that and so on. And I learned all over again, all over again that it doesn't go that way. Uh, if I, if I open my hand, if I open my hand to the mystery and allow miracle to happen. And it did over and over throughout the day and particularly the rather magical afternoon where everything I thought I knew I put down and the 
retreat took on an entirely different shape than I would have told you at the beginning of the day that it would have looked like. And one of the participants who came in with her own notions about what would be uh, her experience and how she would relate to me, uh, she said, you surprised me. This surprised me. Um, and I, I would say that I surprised me and the retreat surprised me. It was quite delicious. It was uh, in all the best ways. Um, when, so the, the takeaway, once again, as, as if I needed that lesson again, and apparently I did, is just to open my hand to the mystery and allow myself to be surprised and certainly in yesterday's case, delighted. What do you think are like some of the barriers to doing that? Because I found that it, do, like the, the idea of surrender, it does feel like a surrender has to take place and it can actually feel vulnerable to do that. And on this other side of that, it does feel like there's liberation. But what do you feel like are some of the barriers that people can, you know, people that are listening that, hear that what what might be some of the things that prevent them from really kind of opening the hand to the mystery trust or lack thereof i think it i think it boils down to trust and i think the word surrender is loaded um one of my dearest friends and teachers um uh, who's uh, no longer in this plane of existence he died about five years ago uh in the last years of his life which was a century long uh told me that he had substituted the word yield for the word surrender. He said, I've been using the word surrender. I surrender my preferences to God, is what he used to say. And he said, I've now come to say that I yield my preferences to God. He said, I've spent my whole life trying to develop a lover relationship with God. And he said, I don't think, and this is a little bit of American history here, so bear with me for your international audiences. Uh, uh, I don't think General Lee, who was the leader of the Confederate States of America, when he laid down his sword before General Grant in 1865, the um, commander in chief of the Northern armies, when he laid down his sword in surrender to General Grant, he was not, uh, he says, I doubt that General Lee was feeling lover energy in that moment. So surrender has this war. With, uh, surrender is the cessation of war. And he explained that yield is what you do with the lover's touch. The lover wants to move your hip this way or your arm this way. And, and he or she gently touches you here and you yield to their pressure of that loving touch, because you trust. You trust. It's not attack. And, but I think that we associate the giving up of control as um, somehow related to war. I need, I cannot trust the situation. So I need to exert control over it. And I will not surrender. Mm. And so when we say, well, I will now surrender, we're, we're still in the war footing. Mm -hmm. But if I say I'm going to yield to the mystery, mm. there's something kind of delicious about that, even erotic. Yeah, I see that. I see that. And as you said that, it made me wonder, made me wonder is, it, is it maybe the ego that surrenders? Because it feels like it's like that kind of egoic sense of self that maybe wants to have that control and sometimes that battle for control. So maybe it's, um, maybe it's related to the part of us that feels that, you know, more of that, that sense or need around it. But yeah, yield feels... Almost like a, almost like a willingness to receive rather mm. than to give up. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. And if we can treat it as a gift to receive the gift 
of the lover's touch, even when it doesn't feel like the lover's touch, even if it feels like, um, even if there's pain of some sort associated with it, if we can open ourselves, trust the situation enough that we can find the loving impulse behind that touch. I think that's why the word yield works so well for me is the, the lover's touch. We have a, if we have a really good lover relationship with our beloved, then we trust that their motives are loving. And if we apply that to the world as lover or to God as lover, then if I'm in a real lover relationship with reality or God, then I find myself trusting that wh whatever it might feel like in the moment, the underlying impulse is love. Even if I can't see it on the surface, it may require that I get curious and inquire, like, where is the love behind this moment? So that I can receive it. See, if I, if I trust that there is love beneath whatever's happening, then I might be able to trust and in that trust yield to reality. I just want to take a quick minute to tell you about the Freedom Within Mastermind. Now, over the last 12 months, I really wanted to craft this absolutely complete transformative program that would guide people through a process of really unraveling anything in their life that was preventing them from feeling true freedom within. Freedom from the past of all the story, all the experiences, everything that we may hold on to that prevent us from feeling the freedom to be, to be who we truly are in our fullest, truest expression. And then lastly, from that place to discover the freedom to become, to become what it is that your heart yearns for fully, with purpose, with direction, with this full fuck yes, this is me, this is my purpose, this is my gift, and this is my path, with full clarity on knowing what that is, with coherence between the mind and the heart. Now, we launched this at the beginning of January, and what I can say is the transformations that have happened in the first few weeks have actually surprised me. I knew it was going to be amazing, but I would say it's surpassed what I really could have thought it was going to be. And part of that is not just down to the modules that have been created and the self-study, but when we do the group Q&A calls, the energetic transformations that are happening live on call are affecting everybody. So one person is having a profound realization shift, clearing old energy, releasing ultimately a lie and seeing the truth that sets them free and as they do it's having a knock-on effect to everybody else on the call honestly it's been incredibly powerful and i feel blessed i feel blessed to be able to play this role and i don't really feel like it's entirely me i feel like i'm a vessel or an instrument and i'm just opening myself up and allowing the divine to come through to help guide this process to facilitate these deep transformations that aren't just on the level of the minds, but really we're seeing some transcendent experiences where people are saying they're having things akin to psychedelic journeys through some of these processes. Now, if this calls out to you, I'm going to put a link below for the Freedom Within Mastermind where you can check it out and you can schedule a free call so you can find out more about it, ask questions, and also for us to connect what I can say is it's my deepest honor and delight to be able to play this role in facilitating the transformative journey within people that decide to join and become a member of the mastermind. So if that calls out to you or you'd just like to know more about it, hit the link in the pinned comments and book a free call to find out more and ultimately to find out if it is the right fit for you for where you're at in your journey at this point in your life. All right, that's it from me. Let's get back into the episode. Hmm. yeah you know as you say that it makes me consider times with my daughter where there'll be things that I do out of love which might not necessarily be the thing that she wants maybe she doesn't want to 
you know, make her bed in the morning and not just watch TV <laughs> uh, straight away. Uh, and of course, you know, developing those um, those behaviors and habits for me to help her develop those is a loving thing to do, even though, and, and it's not that there's a, there's not a battle around it. You know, she's a, she's a pretty, you know, she's pretty forthcoming. As soon as I ask her that, she'll, she'll do it. But I can imagine there are things that to her might be like a, oh, but of course, from my perspective, it's coming from love. So as you're saying that, I'm thinking from my perspective as a parent in that way, then yeah, how many things are happening in life that might feel similar? Like I'm almost like, you know, almost from that child's perspective of not being able to necessarily see the love that, that it is coming from. However, it's it's ultimately there. Right. Imagine... Um the pain from a fever mm. like this is an unpleasant experience i've got let's say i've got the flu and i'm aching my whole body hurts because i've got the flu mm. if i don't understand and don't trust if i if i start with the presumption that if it feels bad you must not love me reality Mm. then I, I fail to understand what's actually happening. But if I trust, I mean, I could operate at two levels. I could, I could just trust whatever this is, this is good for me. Or I could learn the, uh, the biology of it and say, oh, this is my immune system fighting illness. Thank you. Mm. Um, but in the moment, it doesn't feel like love or like my primitive notions of what love should feel like but if i trust that the underlying impulse under the whole thing is love mm. the, in the song of solomon the, the, its insides are lined with love is is uh, one of the expressions uh, that mm. you know, our, our friend mark Goffney uh, refers to one of the, the passages in the Song of Solomon. Its insides are lined with love. If we apply that to all of creation and then trust that that is so, mm. then even in my aching body, I can, I can let go of my own notions that I think I know how I should feel in that moment, trust that the insides are lined with love, and yield to that love. Mm. Yeah, there's something really powerful in that actually. And, um, you know, yesterday I was on a call with the uh, maestro Hamilton Souther and we were touching on some relationship things as it's you know, been alive for, for me in my life. And he was saying that his thing around relationships is to enter into the reality of relationships rather than the fantasy of relationships. Mm. And again, I just kind of tied to that and it maybe it feels like there's something similar with the idea of life and the love that is life, that maybe we have a fantasy about what it should look like and how it's meant to be. And maybe there is the reality. And maybe the reality is that not every act of love always feels like maybe the fantasy of what we think perfect would be. Like what if the perfect response to the fever is to have the temperature which might not feel like the thing that you want. However, it might be the most loving thing your body could do to deal with it. Right, precisely. But that it requires of me a level of trust that I've not always had. Mm. And yeah. that's what I'm still learning. That's what I'm still learning every day. How do I trust? I have a little, little uh, sign on my desk over here that kind of reminds me that I... I am called to trust. I'm called to trust. Now it's in the language that my own private language with my, my around the divine, but basically I'm called to overcome my distrust by surrendering into my trust. And I have to learn it every day. And what, what's the way that you learn that or practice mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. 
Mm. At this point, it's really just reminding. I mean, I have enough evidence in my lifetime that that its insides are indeed lined with love. Mm. Um, by this point, there have been so many really awful things that have turned awful in the moment, in my perception of the moment, mm. that have turned out to be miraculous gifts. But I needed the benefit of hindsight to see that. And that's happened often enough over 68 years that um, it's now just a reminding. I just need to remind myself. You don't know. So why not trust? You don't know that this is bad or good. So why not just trust that it's good because, uh, or that it's at least loving? Forget good. It's at least loving. This event that's arising and that is causing me some pain in this moment. Mm. I just remind myself, of, oh, okay. You know, it could happen to any of us in any context, you know. Oh my God, do I have enough? Uh, does my company have, like it's the CEO who asks, does my company have enough in the in our accounts to run payroll this week? Or um, the... Uh, uh, the, the, the child uh, listening to her father, uh, she's likely to be less tolerant of your loving touch when she's 14 than she is at this <laughs> beautiful age. She's likely to tell you, you don't love me. Mm. Yeah. She's, she's likely to say that sentence to you. You must not love me. And for you to trust that you're coming from a loving place. Um, and that her saying that is a good thing. Or the terrible twos, right? The, that point in a child's life where they're asserting their, asserting their ego, it's just even our language for it, the terrible twos. Boy, if our children didn't go through the terrible twos, they would have no ego strength whatsoever. So even as parents, as we're relating to our children, as they're acting out and practicing saying no, they're learning how to be a human. But in the moment, we don't want that. We have a fantasy of a good child. A good two-year-old doesn't give their father grief. Mm. But a good two-year-old is not the same as a two-year-old who's doing exactly what she needs to do as a two-year-old because her insides are lined with love. And there's something, some deep wisdom in her that is telling her that this is the time in my life I need to say no to that giant human that is my father. And then as parents, we have to hold our center and trust that, oh, this is, this is painful and it feels good. Because I know that this is an essential part of her growth that I would not trade away. Mm. We have to remind ourselves of that. So for me, it's reminding. Yeah. Do you think a lot of people mistakenly use the word love for other things? For example, like the idea of like, oh, you must not love me. Do you think people have this idea that love is just meant to feel a certain way? And maybe actually it's down to a limitation within our vocabulary to identify a range of feelings as though actually I feel this thing rather than not feeling maybe we put it all down to love but is it something else yeah. that maybe people are feeling and we just confuse it I think love's one of the most misunderstood mm -hmm. words on the planet in the English mm -hmm. language I mean it's astonishingly misunderstood mm -hmm. um, uh, this wonderful video online I encourage your viewers to uh, check it out from a rabbi I think his name is Twersky just do Twersky, Rabbi Twersky, fish love. And it's just a very short little video. He says, uh, so I was with a young man and he said, uh, I love this fish. And uh, he said, oh, really? You love that fish? Is that why you killed it, boiled it, and are eating it? Because you love it? He said, and so often our relationships are like that. That's fish love. I love you because you make me feel good. You taste good to my being. Mm. 
Um, and so that's one way we can misunderstand love. And of course, there's also, there's a lot of confusion about love uh, associated with trauma where people have suffered horrible hand uh, trauma at the hands of people who claim to love them. And so they're very appropriately suspicious of the word love. Yeah. Oh, I suffered much harm at the hands of this person who was all the times claiming that they love me. And so they associate love with abuse and dominance and, uh, um, horror. Mm. Uh, and, you know, and that's just a couple of, uh, one could come up with a thousand examples of the misapplication of the word love. I think it's a very dicey word. I use it with caution. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting as you say that, cause it's made me kind of think maybe when a lot of people, let's say for example, in those dynamics where s someone who may be abusive and claim to love the other, maybe what they mean is, you momentarily soothe my trauma. So when they say, I, but I love you, maybe they're saying, no, you momentarily are a means to my end to make me feel okay. And when you don't, all this happens. But yeah, massively, yeah. Miss. Well, think of, how, think of how we can get these confusing messages when we're very young. You're such a good boy. I love you, right? Mm. Oh, she must love me because I'm a good boy. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a very confusing message because right there, it's a conditional flavor of love. Mm -hmm. You're a good boy. Therefore, we put in the, the, I think very often we write in the therefore. I was a good boy. Therefore, she loves me. Mm -hmm. My mom loves me because I was a good boy. Yeah. Or I'm so proud of you. You achieved that beautiful thing. You got that award in school for good grades. I love you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or a couple after an afternoon of beautiful lovemaking. You know, they're just awash in chemicals. You know, these feel-good chemicals. All these feel-good chemicals swirling around their bodies. And then they say, oh, I love you. Do I love you or do I love these chemicals that are swirling around my body that you seem to have something to do with? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing how quickly the I love you can come to a halt when that person isn't doing what you want, what, what you might want them to do. Yeah. You know, as, um, as you say that I was just kind of considering, you know, I've been in, I've been in this kind of like self audit mode with things that I might arise uh, in me, in my relationship and in, in, in the dynamic and just kind of noticing like, Oh, I had some sight on this before, but trying to be more in the inquiry. And, you know, one of the things that I noticed is that if I do or say something that might be quite innocent and if it's taken in the wrong way, which creates a shift in the energetic dynamic, even if it's not externally perceived as volatile, but if it's just like almost like a, a, a closing down, I really feel this need to try to solve the problem. And I find it very, like, literally, I start to notice, I start to sweat more into my arms, like there's a visceral response. And, you know, and, and I just think about like the, some of the home environment that I grew up in, which that quick shift in energetic, you know, that shift in, in energy could be very unsafe, it could be very volatile, very explosive. And it's just amazing, like how even when I can then go to the conscious mind and we said earlier, you know, this doesn't equal that, but how my body still responds in that way. And then it becomes like, there's this internal thing going on where I'm having to tell myself, this isn't that, but my body still thinks it is. <laughs> and it still reacts like I'm, you know, an eight year old boy or something. And it's, it's wild how, those mechanisms can and how it affects the nervous system and um yeah how, how they can last for for a long time even with you know a, a decent degree of awareness mm -hmm.
Yeah. The Kashmir Shaivas call these uh, unprocessed energies mm. from our past, uh, Vikalpas, and they form the basis, in, in, at least through my lens, form the basis of a lot of the work that my colleagues and I do in the somatic energy field, somatic psychology, um, because our minds can't get at it. It's, it's, it's by definition behind our eyeballs. We cannot mm. um, see it. It's in our bodies and our bodies are acting out of and stimulating our mind to act out of these not yet fully processed images from years past, most often, but not always from our uh, childhood and sometimes earliest childhood. Mm -hmm. And so we don't even understand how that works because it's beyond understanding. It's way below the level of understanding, which is why so many of us work in the somatic field is to try to move that energy so that it comes out of the shadows of our subconscious and into our conscious awareness so that we can become aware, shine the flashlight of awareness and attention on a process that may have been hidden from our conscious awareness for decades or, or longer. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it, it really can be a feels like it could be a minefield in in many ways you know especially when you could be walking along quite merrily and then you can just unknowingly step on something and, <laughs> and a bomb goes off inside oh i like that expression a minefield it certainly can can be a minefield but it also uh, my mind also went to it could also be a gold mine mm, it can yeah. also be a gold mine because then when we actually do uncover Sometimes by exploding the, the, the mine, we can uncover the gold and it, it, it finally is accessible to us, even if it involved beating the crap out of a cube with a bat and yelling obscenities at some long dead parent or, or a teacher you can't even imagine being still on the planet or some bully on the schoolyard playground. Um, uh, and there's a kind of imprisonment that these unprocessed subconscious images can put us in. We don't even see the bars. We see a world of possible actions defined by things that we cannot even see. Like mm -hmm. the tiger who's paced in the same 10 foot square cell and they uh, for his whole lifetime and they remove the bars uh, at least the apocryphal story is that the lion will continue to pace within that cell even though the bars are gone and so there's a possibility of really glorious freedom in the uncovering of these long unprocessed um, images mm. Yeah, and, and to that point, just to tie it back into what love looks like, you know, sometimes in those intimate dynamics, like if that landmine goes off, but it is the thing that reveals the gold, then it's, then that is trusting that a loving thing actually is occurring, which is, even though it might not feel pleasant in the time, but the epiphany or the revelation that it can, can lead to can certainly be like, Right. An incredible thing. Right. Even if it, in, it results in the end of the relationship, it may be, although it uh, often doesn't feel like it in the moment, it may be that the end of the relationship is the gold. Mm. Um, the, it may be that the bars, these hidden bars within my own being, have been keeping me in a relationship that is not built for the long haul. And when I reveal those bars that I erected, let's say when I was three, unwittingly, as an appropriate defense to whatever trauma was going on at that time in my life, and remained buried and hidden, but confining my possibilities, when I finally unearth those, either by working with a practitioner or uh, just life causes it to become apparent, 
sometimes life is the practitioner and it causes me to actually see that for the first time. It may be that the loving wisdom of that revelation is, oh my gosh, for me to actually love in the world the way I want to love in the world, I cannot be in this relationship. Mm. And even that we can discover is a loving revelation. Yeah. As to be distinguished from the kind of bar, one with which I'm quite familiar, that has presumed, for example, that the slightest amb sense of ambivalence I have in my partner is my cue to hit the road. Mm. You know, I have, I'm familiar with that long suppressed impulse. It's a, almost an allergy to ambivalence. And probably born out of, almost certainly born out of my own ambivalence about commitment. Mm. That if I de detect ambivalence over there, it might be that, that my subconscious patterns tell me, well, it's not safe. Ambivalence isn't safe. So it's time to leave, which is um, maybe not what's being called for here uh, by love. And maybe the opportunity in a moment such as that is to develop the muscle of staying in the face of all of these signals that to the, to, to my being feel like signals to leave. <laughs> but, but my being is getting its information from some trauma 50 years, 60 years ago. Mm. And if I uncover that and see it for what it is and, move that energy so that it's no longer serving as prison for me, then it, it opens up the possibility that I can respond and not react to the ambivalence I might be detecting in my partner. And it may be that the, the response in that moment, once I've uncovered that is, well, actually, that's a good instinct in this case, I really should leave, or it might be, Oh, you know what? I have a choice here because it's now in my conscious awareness. I have a choice. I could speak of the ambivalence in the room mm. and let's see what happens. Mm. Let's see what we can both learn about our own ambivalence. If I take this opportunity now that I'm freed from the bars of my hidden allergy to ambivalence, Let's get it on the table and speak about our shared ambivalence about a commitment mm. and see what happens. And maybe we'll stay together. But if that's a possibility that I might not have had before I uncovered that. Love I love that. Standing allergy. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. You know, a few weeks ago, I often, uh, I regularly kind of just write thoughts that are coming up. And I was thinking that, you know, something that once freed us can eventually enslave us mm -hmm. and that maybe at one time in one's life leaving was a thing that was required and maybe that freed them but that same impulse to then I, i've got to leave can then kind of enslave them to maybe never experiencing a certain depth because if their reaction is now leave now leave and we were having this conversation just a couple of days ago about you know, for some people leaving is liberating, but then there's also the liberation of knowing how to stay when the impulse in the body is saying leave because that leaving may have been what was required at one time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's a Sheryl Crow song that speaks to the maturation process here that, that uh, this topic of leaving uh, gets to, and she sings, I'll get their lyrics uh, slightly wrong, but she's when I'm throwing punches in the, in the air, it's, are you man enough to be my man? And the implication there is that, have you done enough of your work? Are you grown up enough? Have you matured enough? So that even when I've lost my mind, you'll stay. Mm. And, and that does speak to a kind of, uh, spiritual maturity that, uh, I, I'm not sure for many of us has not come easily because it was the, the reasons for the lack of maturity were so deeply buried. Yeah. Yeah. And with you mentioning the spiritual maturity there, you know, there's something that we spoke about on WhatsApp before 
Um, I just wanted to kind of quickly loop back to it. You said one of the topics that you're exploring um, is to work with people across their entire lives. And it was, and, and what would it be to hold every act throughout the day as a spiritual act? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that, that, that was really, really interesting to me. I'd love to hear some of the thoughts that are alive for you around that. Like what, what does it mean to hold mm. every act throughout the day as a spiritual one? Oh, I remember that exchange we had. Um, yeah, it, this comes out of a notion that I, uh, that occurred to me a few years ago. I'm not quite sure the source of it, but that all of us, even those who say they have no spiritual life, all of us are engaged in some sort of, um, spiritual act always what uh, or what is the nature of that act really is the question uh, bob dylan's song you've got to serve somebody um, uh, religion the word religion is and there are a couple of possible etymologies of that but the one that seems most likely to me ties it to obligation Uh, and uh, binding and serving. So um, if I get clear about what and who I'm serving, uh, let's just start with the assumption that my whole life is uh, can reveal what and who I am serving. If I dedicate my life to the making of money, for example, then I'm serving money. if, or if it's power, then I'm serving power. I'm dedicating my life to power. Um, and so that's, uh, we might say, well, that's not a religious life. But if I'm, if I'm binding myself, religar, I think is the Latin word under, uh, underlying religion, uh, then how is it different than a priest who takes vows or a monk who takes vows and binds himself or a nun who takes vows and um, uh, marries Christ or whatever it is. How is it different? If I take vows, I I vow to be wealthy or I vow to be powerful. How at its deepest level is that different? So it's not even so much choosing to live every moment of our life as a spiritual act, but seeing it as already that, and then choosing my religion. Mm. What religion do I want to belong to? Do I want to belong to the religion of striving, of wealth accumulation, of uh, uh, bolstering my ego? Is that my religion? Or is my religion love or something else? But it, I, I think at its deepest level, what I'm speaking to here is the recognition that it already is. Our lives are already a 24-7 religious act. Mm. And that if we wake up, uh, we are waking up to the religion that we want to be in. Mm. And uh, it's not Islam or Christianity or Judaism or Hinduism or Kashmir Shaivism or Taoism or what, you know, Zen, or it's, it's, it's not that kind of choice. It's how do I want, how, what am I going to bind myself to? What's my schedule full of today? What is my attention full of? Mm. Where am I placing my attention, which is where I'm, where am I placing my heart? And if I'm placing my heart on something other than love, then that's worth examining. Of course, it's also worth examining what, what do I mean by love? Hmm. You know, if I, yeah, I've d- devoted my entire life to love. Well, what, what do you mean by love? Yeah. Do you mean sex? Do you mean um, uh, uh, having the partner that bolsters your ego? Uh, what, what do you mean by love? My brother Mark um, uh, loves the song. Actually, it was KK. Loves the song. I want to know what love is. Mm-hmm. And 
And I think that's a beautiful question, more beautiful than the song itself, actually. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's a valuable inquiry because it's an inquiry in, for those of us who say we're committing our lives to loving. It's a, use, a valuable inquiry to say, well, what, what do I mean by that? What am I actually committing myself to? And what is the religion to which I am binding myself? Mm. Who, am I, who am I serving? What am I serving? Mm. So, yeah, it's not so much about what would it be, and I may have phrased it inarticulately in our uh, WhatsApp chat. Uh, I think today's version would be not so much what would it be to live life uh, as a 24-7 spiritual experience, uh, so much as what, what would it be to recognize that my 24-7 experience is, um, is an exploration of what my religion is. Mm. Yeah, that is a good inquiry. And how do you think that would affect your day-to-day -day experience mm. with the conscious awareness of where you're placing your attention or your heart or, or what your quote-unquote religion is? Oh, I think the impact is it's likely to blow up a life. It's likely to totally trash the way a life uh, looks. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're liable to leave relationships or leave jobs or once, once we actually do that, change careers, once we actually do that, it could be incredibly disruptive. So if we love comfort, it's not a very, uh, it, it, could, it could be a very uncomfortable discovery. Mm. Oh my God, I'm dedicating my life to that, which is probably why it's an uncommon inquiry. Because if you are, and I, I would say that uh, one of the largest religions on the planet is the devotion to the God of comfort. And uh, lowering the waterline on this set of covered beliefs uh, could be very uncomfortable and could cause you to leave your religion of comfort. Yeah. And to have to, to be faced with the, the God at whose altar you worship. Oh my God, I'm worshiping at the altar of comfort. That sounds awful. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds very uncomfortable. I better not look that way. And I think a lot of people have taken a peek at that and said, oh, not that. And then continued on their, uh, on their straight and narrow with, uh, with their religion of comfort or whatever it is. Because it's very uncomfortable to look at that. It could be very disruptive. Yeah, comfort and maybe and maybe dopamine for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Religion sure. of dopamine, cheap cheap dopamine hits. Yeah, yeah. I can. Uh... Hmm. Yeah, boy, a swirl of of uh, addictions just came to mind. Um, I was reading a article about Eric Clapton um, and his. Um, battles with alcohol several decades ago. He said, the only reason I didn't kill myself is because then I'd have to stop drinking. And so he was worshiping at the altar of the feeling that alcohol gave him. And he had to come up with a new religion. And I, I don't know what that religion is, but he had to find a new God other than the feeling that alcohol gave him. Now that feeling, by his own admission, kept him alive. Mm. but at a certain point it was uh, harming the thing he loved most which is his own music and uh, and i think he remembered that he really worships at the altar of the god of music and he reminded himself of that and then gave up the booze but it was uh, for a while it was his god mm sex has its own addictive properties and 
all of the addictions are, it seems to me, a yearning, a reflection, a symptom of our yearning for that connection to the all that is, distorted though it may be. And so I think if we start really uncovering this series of questions around who, at whose altar do I worship, mm. um, we may find that we are liberated by our awareness of that process and liberated by the revelation of what I have been worshiping and liberated by the possibility that I could choose a better God than money or dopamine um, or cocaine or uh, power mm. or comfort, the most addictive. Yeah. Um, what, what would you, if you could put it into words, what would you say that God is? Well, there's the rub. If you could put it into words. Yeah, the, the God that can be put into words is not God, to, uh, to borrow from the Taoists. The Tao, yeah. Yeah, that's, the, we, that's where we started. We're back to where we started, Sabre. Uh, it's the mystery in the middle of the room. I bow to the mystery in the middle of the room, and I trust that something I might call divine love is that mystery, something I can't hope to understand. Can't hope to my my little uh, my little human mind uh, is uh, has too narrow a bandwidth to understand. That friend of mine I mentioned, Jerry, used to say, "Understanding is the booby prize." Mm -hmm. uh, and it's because I mean, if you think about the the narrow band of light that we humans can detect, and then the narrow band of sounds that we can detect. And then just apply that all the way out to the human experience. We have such a narrow slice of the infinite experience or process that is the all. Then if I come away from an encounter with that vastness, with anything except uh, radical humility, then I've uh, probably deluded myself as to what I'm looking at. Oh, yeah, I can see the whole thing. Mm. Oh, I, I have a name for that. <laughs> That's why I'm a little slow to answer your question. What would I call that? It's like, oh, I don't have, I don't really have a good name for that. You know, yeah. I, you know, sometimes I'll say God or goddess or love, but it doesn't quite do it yet because of how fraught those words are. Mm. Words what are fraught. Think, what, what do you think it is that, like in your experience, in your practice, you know, people that find themselves on this path of trying to discover that or to, to feel that connection to something greater than, if we were to say God, have you noticed, is there like a, something that people experience that lead them to that place? Because there are some people that will go their entire lifetime without ever exploring that possibility. Have you seen like a common thread that lead people in the, like to the desire of exploring what that is? Yeah, I have. Um, a few years ago, I had a very short lived project of interviewing a bunch of my friends about the subject of love. And I called it based on the, the poem, uh, the Sufi poem, the subject tonight is love. Um, and what I noticed was that each of them had an experience when they were young that exposed them to something ineffable that felt like love. In one case, um, one person I interviewed, it was family. He knew that in that family there was love. In another case, it was a little girl in her backyard. In fact, that man's daughter, it, for her, it was when she was four years old in nature, in the woods. And she had this experience that she today, in her 70s, calls love. And I, I think it's true to say that in every or almost every case, there was a, 
a moment or a series of moments that alerted them to something beyond what they could explain or that the people around them could explain, but was real and compelling mm -hmm. that had the flavor of what they now believe is love. And they started either immediately or years later sniffing around for what that was about. Mm. That's interesting. I think that might, I think I was thinking it might have been the opposite. I was wondering if it may have been people that maybe hadn't experienced that and then were in pursuit of it. Mm. Interesting. Well, and uh, certainly mine was not a scientific survey. I was just calling my friends. <laughs> <laughs> would you get a, would you set up a camera and talk to me for an hour about love? <laughs> uh, so this is uh, my sampling methods were, yeah. were uh, probably limited to a privileged few, a distinctly privileged group of people. Um, but sure, I mean, love hides in all sorts of places. Mm. Um, love hides in the belt on the back. Um, and uh, that's also pretty mysterious. How do we find the love in what's going on in Ukraine or Gaza? Mm. You know, how do we trust the Song of Solomon's claim that its insides are lined with love if we look at the 25,000 children a day that die of starvation. It takes um, humility to trust that love is lining all of that. Because mm. I sure don't understand it. And I don't have language for it. Yeah, really, yes, yeah, really beyond comprehension. I mean, my brain can construct elegant proofs, right? But they fall so short of what must be true mm. that I don't even bother with them. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it feels like I would be looking pretty stupid if I did that. <laughs> elegant intellectual explanations for the horrors of war or famine mm. or the blindness of our species to what we're doing to our planet. To, to trust that love is under all of that. It's a big ask, but it's one that I've chosen because mm. it beats the hell out of the other alternatives I've tried. And, and lastly, you know, with, with you saying that then, what, what's, the, what's the experience of that when you, with having chosen that, what would you say is the main kind of impact that has on on your experience of life mm. Mm. depth and by depth i mean in order for me to hold that i have to take a step back away from what is going on at the surface and tap into a deep inner knowing and awareness. That awareness that is not impacted by the glittery surfaces of our world of form. And to find that deep, deep place within myself that is universal and is peace. And that is depth. So the experience of depth, uh, yeah, well, I, I can't go much beyond that. It's an experience of depth. Yeah. Yeah, it feels to me that within that depth, there's a, there's a richness to that which maybe can't f be found in many of the places. Yeah, I can't find it anywhere else. I'm most in touch with it most days in my morning meditation. And then I return to that throughout the day. It's like, oh, right, that. Mm. Oh, right, that. That's why I meditate an hour every day. It's because enough of those days, enough of those one-hour sessions, 
5.30 or 6.30 in the morning have revealed that to me, mm. that I can call upon that as a resource, that depth to say, okay, that's true. This is only partially true. That's true. That depth is true. Mm. This glittery surface stuff on the world of form is distracting mm -hmm. from what is true. So does that meditation give you something to kind of anchor into? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Interestingly, uh, Sabri, I, uh, it only shows up at about the 45 minute mark. And, you know, for years I meditated just less than, than that. And I didn't ever get to it. It was only when I really stretched out the meditations that it started showing up. Mm. It's like it, it, it was my, my particular shaped mind. There was so much busyness that it very often wouldn't get past the glittery surfaces of my mind. And uh, it takes a while for me to settle down. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I feel that. I've had moments where I've not been able to hit it at all. I've also had moments where I've hit it in a few minutes mm -hmm. and uh, it can be, it can just vary so much, but to, to have the discipline to be able to sit and to reach that point is, well, it, it is that, isn't it? It's a, it's a, a discipline of, of sorts. Yeah. And in my particular case, it comes out of a, uh, my, my partner and I discovered that we, we like meditating with each other. We like the shared energetic space of sitting down and, you know, whenever both of us are fully awake and ready to go, we say, you ready? And we just dive in. So I have support. I'm, I'm not sure I would do it every morning with the regularity and at the length that I, 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 I my mind would probably start making up good reasons for me not to do that. But uh, it's a little bit like how I sometimes navigated school. I find a good study partner. You know, <laughs> meet you on Saturday. We'll outline this week's classes. You know, th that's what very often what we do for each other in this context as well. It's not unlike having a conversation with you. You invite me into uh, explorations that I don't always get to do. And so I'm grateful. Well, I'm certainly grateful for you, uh, for you being here and for us having these conversations. It always, um, everyone we've had always, I feel like I drop into a certain energy and hmm, yeah, I get a whole lot from them. So, you know, thank you so much for it and uh, for being here once again. Thank you, Sabri. It's always a delight. Let's do it as often as you like. I'd love to. Thank you. All right. Take care.